Shabbat Shalom, everyone. And today we're going to look at the coat of many colors. We are preparing for Passover. And this is the season of Passover leading up to that marvelous great day. And we're focusing on Joseph. And what Joseph experienced was a type and shadow of not only what Yahusha would experience, but also what we ourselves will experience. Joseph was a shepherd of Yah's people, and he served in a kingly, priestly role in Egypt. And likewise, so have been the Josephs, plural, of this world to this day, and those that have been before us. We are the final remnant the final threads of the coat of many colors being woven into Yah's priestly garment. The scarlet thread woven from Genesis to Revelation binds us to one another and binds us to you. He is the manna. He is the manna from heaven and those in covenant are in him. We, like the manna in the wilderness, was scattered upon the earth, just like the manna was scattered, and the manna had to be gathered. So are we. We are like the manna in the wilderness, scattered upon the earth, and we have to be gathered together, just like the manna in the wilderness had to be gathered together and formed and molded and pressed into a cake. So does Yahuwah mold and press us into our purpose and presses us into him and into one another. He gathers us together in him and we become what? We become one in him. He is the head, we are the body. He is a good shepherd that gathers and leads us from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Joseph's coat of many colors was just the shadow picture of Yahusha taking upon himself our sins. He purchased us and redeemed us by his precious blood. He, we rest like this coat of many colors. We rest upon his shoulders and he is the very center, is he not, of our existence. This is so awesome. This is so magnificent. And this is is what Passover is all about. Passover, Passover. This is what Passover is all about. And though we love our brothers and sisters and though we understand they have veiled eyes right now, I just pray they can start by calling this most precious Moedim, his appointed time by the correct name. It's Passover, plain and simple, Passover. It's Passover. This is when he did his most greatest work for us. It's Passover. It's not Easter that celebrates a fertility goddess. No, he loves us. He, he didn't come into this world to condemn us. And I don't want this to come across as being condemning. I truly do not because I used to call it Easter. I was there. Many of us that gather on Shabbat, we were there. I'm not trying to have this come across as condemning. We love our brothers and sisters that still may be veiled in many aspects of truth that are in the traditional church, but at least let this be a starting point at the foot of the crucifixion tree. That is Passover and it's your feast day with your groom. It's not just some Jewish Judaism feast, no. It is Yah's feast for his bride. Please see the importance of it. Please say happy Pass Passover in place of happy Easter. Please honor him by recognizing his feast day as Passover. Isn't that just freeing? Isn't it just, uh, it's it's a time to rejoice, even to say the word Passover. We should be intimately aware of what the coat of many colors is and that it still exists 
and thrives. For we, the remnant of believers in Yahushua HaMashiach, Israel, born from above, are, we are, the final colors being woven into Yah's priestly royal garment after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, verse 4, Yahuwah has sworn and does not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. It is the same pattern of the wilderness encampments. He is the center and always has been the center. He is the center and he cloaks himself with us. We surround him. We, he, he is cloaked in us. He has told us we are his treasured possession from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, which includes every color of people group, does it not? Every color. He surrounds himself with the coat of many colors. Yahuwah led a mixed multitude out of Egypt with the first exodus, and he will do so again with the greater exodus spoken of in Isaiah 11. Together with Yahushua, we are the repairer of the breach between the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Soon the fracture of Israel that occurred after the death of Solomon will, will be healed. That break will be healed. Soon and very soon, the tabernacle will be complete. For we are the temple. We are the tab tabernacle. And we will tabernacle with him. Soon the house of Judah, our brethren, that have observed us from afar and refuse to acknowledge that the birthright belongs to us, Ephraim, Joseph, they will come to us. We read of this taking place in Jeremiah chapter 3. In verse 17, we read, At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yahuwah, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of Yahuwah, to Jerusalem, and no longer walk after the stubbornness of their evil heart. In those days, the house of Judah shall go to the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers." Revelation 5, 6, then I looked and saw a lamb standing in the center of the, of the throne that was surrounded by the four living creatures. And we know those were the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, do we not? Yes. And what were the four banners, lead banners in the wilderness encampments? The lion, the fox, the eagle, eagle and the man. Same. Types and shadows. But the originals were the heavenlies. And you can't have a shadow without an original source. Can you not? You cannot. There has to be an original. So where was the original of the wilderness encampments? It was in the heavenlies. Moses saw it. He replicated what he was told to do on earth. So verse six in Revelation five, then I looked and saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne that was surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb looked as if it had once been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Elohim sent out to all the earth. Going back to Jeremiah verse 19 of Jeremiah three. But I said, how would I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land, a splendid inheritance of the host of nations? And I said, call me my father and do not turn away from me. But indeed, as a wife betrays her husband, so have you betrayed me, O house of Israel, declares Yahweh. A voice was heard on the bare heights, weeping supplications of the children of Israel because they have perverted their way. 
They have forgotten Yahweh their Elohim. Return, O backsliding children. I shall make you your backslidings cease. See, we have come to you, for you are Yahuwah our Elohim. Truly delusion, truly delusion comes from the high hills, the noisy throng on the mountains. Truly in Yahuwah our Elohim is the deliverance of Israel. For shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We shall lie down in our shame while our reproach covers us, for we have sinned against Yahuwah our Elohim, we and our fathers from our youth, even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of Yahuwah our Elohim. John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men unto myself. The breach will be repaired. That break in the center of the two houses will be repaired. Israel will become one again. And the name is Israel, his firstborn. So we will be with him and he will be with us. The breach will be repaired. The tabernacle we will be finished. The two houses that enter into his gate with thanksgiving and his court with praise by the blood of the lamb and his new covenant confirming gospel message will be his. The unconverted and those that are converted but are still feeding on mixed doctrine can still draw close to him, can still give their life to him. There is still time and hope for those that have not been born anew, those that are unconverted from death unto life through Yahushua, those in Judaism and those that worship, worship pagan gods. And there is still time for those that have been converted and believe in Yahushua, Jesus the Messiah, to draw positionally closer to him by obeying his covenant and not mixing in the doctrines of men. Yah made the covenant with Isaac, and from Isaac came Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Yahuwah is the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the righteous line that leads to the narrow path by faith in the blood of the Lamb that few find. In Genesis 17, we read, and Elohim said to Abraham at the time, no, Sarah, your wife is truly bearing a son to you and you shall call his name Isaac and I shall establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with the seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. See, I shall bless him and shall make him fruitful and greatly increase him. He is to bring forth 12 princes and I shall make him a great nation. But my covenant, I establish with Isaac, whom Sarah is to bear to you at this appointed time next year. Very important scripture to be aware of. And then we drop down to Genesis 27, verse 36 and verse 41. And Esau said, and this is after Isaac blessed Jacob. And Esau said, was his name then called Jacob? For he has caught me by the heel these two times. He took my birthright and seeing now he has taken my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? And because of that, 
we read in verse 41, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father draw near, then I am going to kill my brother Jacob. So brother will turn against brother. And this is the same battle that's going on, the battle over the birthright and the blessing. And we see Joseph's brother turning against him in verse 18 of Genesis 37. And they saw him from a distance. And before he came near them, they plotted against him to kill him. Do we see a lot of things being plotted against the Josephs of this world today? I do believe. Is not also their goal to kill the Josephs of this world? Seems that way. So verse 18 again, and they saw him from a distance and before he came near them, they plotted against him to kill him. And they said to each other, see, this master of dreams is coming. Now then come and let us now kill him and throw him into some pit and she'll say some wild beast has devoured him. Let us then see what comes of his dreams. Verse 21 of Genesis 37. But Reuben heard and rescued him from their hands and said, let us not strike his being. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him in order to rescue him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Well, that was his goal anyway. So it came to be when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his robe, the long robe, which was on him. And they took him and threw him into a pit and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. So where is the pit? The pit is in the wilderness, this fallen world in which we live. We are presently living, if you will, in the wilderness, and we are presently living in the pit. And they did not want to lay a hand on him. This is key. The walking dead in this world, those not of Yahusha, have the same desire as their father, the devil. Their desire is to steal, kill, and destroy the Josephs, plural, the righteous ones that make up the royal coat of many colors. But they desire not to directly lay their hands on the righteous, but to do so indirectly. Pits of the enemy surround us daily, socially, economically, pharmacologically, environmentally, and technologically, especially with AI. AI technology feeds off of the tree of good and evil. Can it produce good? It can, but it can also produce much evil. And AI technology will make all that I just mentioned look like Ned and the first reader. From unconstitutional decrees that chip away at our freedoms, health, and livelihoods to AI technology that has the ability to be programmed with massive amounts of knowledge and laws and could actually kill without remorse and without consequence. Can an AI robot be sentenced to life imprisonment? What could would that do? Put him behind bars? What? Hmm. AI will carry out what it is programmed to do. AI, therefore, is the instrument that could kill indirectly. It's a possibility. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but it is a strong possibility coming from the creators of such AI technology themselves. This battle has raged and will continue to rage to the very end between the brethren within and without. The struggle 
that we read about between Esau and Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel over the birthright and the blessing is the same shadow picture battle that will rage to the end of days. Anyone not born anew represented by the camp of Esau that have not surrendered to Yahushua, that have not crossed over to become part of the one new man, Israel, born from above by the blood of the lamb, these do not possess their royal wedding garment. Because of that, they are filled with jealousy, envy, and strife, just as Joseph's brothers were. And Joseph's brothers chose to sell Joseph for silver. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal and they lifted their eyes and looked and saw a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilad with their camels bearing spices, balm and myrrh going to take them down to Egypt. The earthly wilderness powers that exist today have sold us out to the Esau's of the world. They have created a Ponzi scheme to funnel funds directly into their pockets by those proclaiming to belong to God. This deception has caused Christian Zionism to flourish and sell out their true brother, Joseph, because of their lack of knowledge. Evil is being called good and good is being called evil. Yahweh's word of truth has been chipped away and so craftily distorted that the masses are gravely confused. Thus, you end up facing mob rule, as did Yahusha himself. Today, since 1948, Esau has even usurped the use of his brother's name, Israel. Names and scripts have been flipped to confuse. The two Israels are not the same. The enemy counterfeits everything. The true Israel is not the state in the Middle East condoned and allowed by the League of Nations, now the United Nations. The head of true Israel is Yahushua, and we the body are the remnant of the coat of many colors that drape his shoulders. We presently are in the pit and prison of mystery Babylon, quote unquote Egypt, but one day soon we will be in the palace. Yah led Israel out of Egypt in the first exodus and declared Israel to be his firstborn son. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22 and 23, and you shall say to Pharaoh, thus said Yahuwah, Israel, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go to serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, see I am killing your son, your firstborn. Thus, he will do the same in the greater Exodus described in Isaiah 11. In verse 26 of Genesis 37, and Judah said to his brothers, what would we gain if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? You know, come on, let's make some money at least, right? You know, in essence, that was the gist behind that statement. Verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand, let not us directly, not let us directly touch his flesh. Let somebody else do it. Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, but it really is, isn't it? It really is. And let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brothers listened. And men, Midianite traders passed by. So they pulled Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. We know, never sell the righteous for silver. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Yahushua was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And likewise, we have been sold by the secular and religious hirelings of this world. And they know who they are. And so does Yah. There's no escaping. 
doesn't matter if they connive and have someone else do the touching, someone else do the dirty deeds. It goes all the way back to the source. Matthew 10, 21, and brother shall deliver up brother to death and a father his child and children shall rise up against parents and shall put them to death. Matthew 10, 24 through 25. A taught one is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the taught one to become like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more those of his household? Verse 34 and 35. Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to bring division, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies or those of his household, his own household. As it was for Joseph and the greater Joseph, Yahushua HaMashiach, Persecutions will first come through our own brethren that are still veiled and deceived and are actually funding the enemy. Did you hear that? They are actually funding the enemy for their own demise. <laughs> Very crafty, right? So persecutions will come through our own brethren that are still veiled and deceived and from among those in our very households. How and why is explained in 2 Timothy verse 4. The opposite of correctly identifying types and shadows in the Bible is believing the smoke and mirrors of man. Paul in his last letter to Timothy, who was like his very own son, explains in verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. In the sight of Elohim and the master Yahushua HaMashiach, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his reign, I earnestly charge you. We must understand right there, we must understand the difference between the living and the dead, or else we will minimize what the power of the blood of the lamb did for us. Now, before we were believers, we knew what, was alive and what was dead. That was just physically something either breathed or it didn't breathe anymore and it was dead. That's all living and death meant to us before we were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. But the living and the dead has much greater meaning to us today. Once we are truly born again, we are the living, not the dead. Even if we die, we live. We are the living. We are the living by the blood of the lamb. There is life in the blood. There is life in the blood. In John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Yahushua said to her, he's speaking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. That's what Yahushua said, not Libby. That's what Yahushua said, not Libby. He who believes in me, though he dies, he shall live. And everyone that is living and believing in me shall never die at all. Do you believe this, Martha? He was saying, do you believe this? Because she didn't have it fully correct. She knew her brother would raise on the last day. She didn't get the full message. And it's important for us to get the full message. That's why he went on to explain he's the resurrection and the life. The dead are the unconverted. They walk around us every day. They are the walking dead. And if they stay in that condition, they are doubly dead for they will experience the second death. 
the living, those born anew in Yahushua are the living. If they die, they live absent from the body and present with Yahuwah. Those that have gone on before us will receive their glorified bodies first at the resurrection because though they have ascended, they await their bodily resurrection. When the death angel sees the blood, what does it do? When the death angel, are you listening? When the death angel sees the blood, what does it do? Whoosh, passes over. When the death angel sees the blood, whoosh, it passes over. Are you under the blood? Then the death angel passes over you because you are the living. Believers go through a type of death, which Yahushua termed as sleep, to differentiate our kind of death from the dead. We are not the dead. We are the living. Hallelujah. True believers have a different experience with death because we shall live. Believers only pass through the shadow of the passing death angel. Believers only pass through the shadow of the passing death angel. When the death angel sees the blood, don't touch that. When the death angel sees the blood of the Passover lamb that covers us, that covers our house, that covers our dwelling. We are the temple. When the death angel sees the blood of the Passover lamb, the covenant seal, it passes over. This is a first exodus type and shadow of what the greater exodus will be like. Is this not the full meaning of pass over? Is this not the full meaning of Passover? It is the power of, it is the power of his precious blood. Life, life, life is in the blood. We are sealed. And that's recorded in Revelation 7, 3. So we proceed in 2 Timothy with verse 2. Proclaim the word, be urgent. Be urgent, time is short. Be urgent in season, out of season. Convict, warn, appeal, and with all patience and teaching. I hope that's what we're doing. That's all we can do. We can only do our best to share the good news. We can only do our best to be urgent in season, out of season to lovingly con convict, lovingly warn, lovingly appeal with all patience and teaching, not with condemnation. We, we share and do this out of love, not with condemnation. He did not come to condemn the world. He knows the deception we're faced with. He knows the deception we've been in. He knows we are being sanctified each day and those lies and that, that leaven is coming out of us. He's ridding us of that leaven that we have absorbed over the years from man-made doctrines and teachings. Verse three, for there shall be a time when they shall not bear sound teaching. Oh no, but according to their desires, they shall heap up for themselves teachings that tickle their ear. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. What? Think about it, people. Think about it. It's time. His return draws nigh. Do not celebrate feast of little G gods. Fellow, celebrate the feast he has given us. Precious feast. These are our wedding rehearsals. The wedding rehearsals teach us about and taught us about his first coming, but also teaches us about his second coming because he wants his bride to be ready when he comes. He wants his bride's lamp to be full and to be burning. 
And it goes on in verse four, and they shall indeed turn their ears away. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. Why? Because they have not clothed them, themselves with the first piece of armor. Gird your loins with what? Truth. Were not the first Israelites, did they not gird their loins? Did they not have their loins girded? Staff in hand, were they not ready? We too should have our loins girded in truth. First and foremost is truth. It's a very big deal. Why is it a big deal? Because he is truth. He is truth. The devil is a liar. And he is the father of lies. And he's sitting back and he's laughing at Yahuwah's people because they have turned their ears away. And they have turned aside to myths. And we've all been guilty of that at some point in time. But he wants us to turn to him and turn to truth. Paul goes on to tell Timothy, but you be sober in all matters. Suffer hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Accomplish your service completely. For I am already being poured out. And the time of my departure has arrived. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have guarded the belief. I've guarded the faith. For the rest, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the master, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those loving his appearing. The lamb you choose occurs on the 10th day of the first month of Abib, which is the season of Passover. Each person must choose. Each person must choose their lamb. The true lamb of Elohim must be a perfect one a year old male. And we went over that last Shabbat in the introduction to types and shadows. So if you haven't watched that, go back to watch that introduction. So we must choose the true lamb of Elohim. Others may declare it to be the way. But we know many false messiahs will arise in the last days. Yahushua is the only way, the truth, and the life. He has given us the new blood ratified covenant. He was identified as behold the lamb of Elohim. He has proposed to us through the new covenant, which is our marriage covenant. He awaits for each one of us to accept his proposal. He has ratified that covenant by his own precious blood. And he is the living bread we partake of in our marriage covenant, confirming the marriage covenant confirming meal of bread and wine. Those are the four elements of a blood ratified covenant of marriage. Proposal, acceptance, blood ratification, and a covenant confirming meal. Others. may offer a counterfeit. These are traditions of men, such as Ishtar Easter. They flip the script. They take away the name Passover and they put on top of it Easter. Easter is the holiday to worship the fertility goddess, Ishtar. 
Others have taken Passover and they've trampled on the blood of Yahusha by going back to the blood of bulls and goats. They do not recognize Yahusha. And you cannot have the father without the son. So if they don't receive the son, they don't have the father. They're worshiping another little G God. Even Easter sunrise services are connected to pagan holidays. Mother Mary worship and the blood of bulls and goats. Passover is the excellent way. Only the blood of the lamb washes away our sins. This will be the most important decision you make in your life the lamb that you choose. Choose well because your choice will become your eternal destination and your eternal position of proximity to him. Choose the, the true Messiah and the true Passover lamb and choose his feast days and not the man-made feast days because the adversary masquerades as an angel of light. The new Passover covenant confirming gospel is ratified by his precious blood. The false Passover incorporates the blood of bulls and goats and other abominations. Easter celebrates Ishtar, mother goddess worship. Ishtar is the fertility goddess that was promoted through Constantine Catholicism and eventually infiltrated and deceived other denominations and places of worship. Yahuwah's Passover is the feast according to his word. It's according to his word that we, his bride, should celebrate. You don't have to listen to me. Just go to his word. His word will tell you what his feast days are, plain and simple. And his blood is the only blood that can take away our sins. Should we really label, listen, should we really label the most pivotal point in all history? with a pagan name of Easter? Should we replace the title of the Passover lamb with an Easter bunny and eggs representing fertility? Would that not be trampling and minimizing what he has done for us and give worship to another God? Can you imagine all that he did for us? He took our sins upon his shoulders he died in our place and we won't even recognize his, his feast when he laid down his life for us. Will we not even recognize it's Passover? Will we not? Really? Really? It, call it Passover. That brings honor and glory to him. Call it, simply call it Passover. Is that too much to ask? Call his feast days by his feast day names. Do his feast days as his word tells us to do his feast days. If you say you believe the Bible, then follow what the Bible says and not what man has taught you. Follow what Yahushua HaMashiach and the Ruach HaKadosh teaches you. Because the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, will lead you to all truth. Call the Passover, Passover. Joseph's, plural. Joseph's of this world. We exist outside the camp. Joseph's are born anew with unique characteristics. These characteristics come with a calling mixed with the ability to exist in the wilderness outside the camp or in lands of plenty. We permeate all socioeconomic levels of life as we are scattered abroad on the seven mountain continents and island nations. Joseph's are those that Yah assigns for such purposes that most would not desire nor survive physically, mentally, or emotionally. Joseph's feed on the manna of heaven amid worldly 
wildernesses and are comforted by the companionship of his Ruach HaKadosh. Joseph's can often be mocked, exiled, and falsely accused within and without. Get used to it. It's okay. If Joseph put up with it, if Yahushua put up with it, if Paul, David, you can name them all in all. Stand firm. Stand. Joseph's are protectors, providers, pathfinders, and rescuers. They are a set-apart people cloaked with his righteousness that can, and that righteousness, that coat of many colors, can bring persecutions fueled by jealousy, envy, and strife. Joseph's are often targeted individuals that can be ridiculed and mocked for being part of the royal coat of many colors. Joseph's choose to walk in covenant and choose to do Bible things in Bible ways. Joseph's choose the priestly line that follows the narrow path and not the party line that chooses the broad path. Believers should always be open to walking according to his will and not our own will and our own way. He understands, he does understand the deceptions we have encountered. He forewarned his disciples and us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And I'll go into that more next week. He went to great lengths to explain this leaven through the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, which I think most of us have not comprehended. The enemy enjoys adding leaven to his word that leads his sheep astray, makes them sickly, makes them hungry, weak. But Yah rejoices when he when we, excuse me, Yah rejoices when we purge out the leaven of lies and replace those lies with truth. I want us all to be cloaked with his righteousness all over the world. Be a part of his set apart kingdom of priests from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Be his coat of many color. We are the last remnant. Shabbat Shalom.